heard other uh, politicians or public figures in their offices, uh, both uh, governors and mayors, who talked about uh, trying to get us back to some sense of normalcy. Uh, some uh, would say and argue that they've opened the nation too soon. Others, specifically certain states, uh, too soon based on the numbers that uh, have gone up uh, and are fluctuated uh, due to the cases of COVID and, and Corona. And so so questions about our future is what is what uh, I believe most and a lot have have on their hearts, have on their minds. Uh, questions about where do we go from here? What can we expect from here? Uh, who knows what who what to believe? Who knows whom to believe? And so uh, tonight I want to deal with uh, mixed emotions about our future, mixed emotions based on the pericope of scripture that you've heard uh, in your hearing. I want to talk about mixed emotions about our future. Uh, I'm reminded of a story that I read some years ago uh, about this this old old um, benevolent king who uh, had men his, his, his men to place a great and heavy stone on a certain roadway over which his subjects were forced to travel. He then hid himself to see who would try to remove the stone only to discover that no one stopped to try to remove the stone. But all who came across the stone worked their way around it, loudly blaming the king for not keeping the roadway clear. Finally, a poor peasant <coughs> farmer on his way to town with a load of vegetables, uh, which he had hoped to sell, in order uh, at the marketplace in order to make a profit in order to feed his family came to the blocked roadway in haste he laid down his load and uh, with considerable effort and loss of time he managed to move this great and heavy stone to the side of the roadway then turning to leave he spied or saw a purse which had been under the stone to which he proceeded to open and found it to be filled with gold. And with the gold accompanied by a note from the king indicating that the one who would remove this stone could take ownership of the gold. My God. I said the one who could remove the stone, or excuse me, would remove the stone. Because here's what I discovered, is that just because you're able to do something doesn't mean that you're willing to do something. And so he says the one who would remove the stone would, would be able to take ownership or possession of the purse that was filled with gold. As I was reading this uh, story in preparation uh, for this lesson, I, I, how quickly I began to uh, draw attention to the fact or it dawned on me uh, that all of us face obstacles and difficulties on what I would call the roadway of life, the, the road of life. The, we, 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 we have two, one or two, actually two options, two options on how to handle life's roads or the obstacles that we face. We can either, we can either watch this, we can either deal with the obstacle and the roadblock or we can, or, or the obstacle and the roadblock can deal with us. I'll say it again. There, there are two ways that we can deal with the obstacles and the uncertainties and the mixed emotions of which we are concerned with as we face this thing called life. One is we can either deal with the obstacles that we contend with on life's highway or we can allow them to deal with us we can either what are you saying apostle we can either go around them and and and, and let another deal with them or we can face them head on overcome them using uh using it for our good and our growth turning adversity into advantage shifting the obstacle into opportunity and making a burden definitely into our blessing and see if we would instead of trying to pine and cry and and avoid and, and I, I tell students all the time I've seen I've, I've watched students I've watched people I, I, you have individuals that would spend an exorbitant amount of time trying to get out of work 
trying to get out of, 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 of investing their time, their energy, their studies, their intellect, their wit, their wherewithal. But instead they will they will cheat, they will rob, they will undermine, they will they will try to work at collaborate and elaborate efforts to get out of doing something. You don't you don't believe me? Watch this. I've seen people who do scams and they'll make a scam look so legitimate. I mean, they'll go through the attention to buy paper to print out a real check on a real with a real account, routing number and a real bank logo, and they'll they'll send it to your house and tell you that you got to do this, that, and the other. And at the end of the day, if you if you don't have the the, the wisdom to call to verify the funds, they may get you because of the elaborate uh, setup and and under which they've invested all this time. Now, watch this. If you call their office, they got somebody in a makeshift office manning a phone to answer your call as if you're calling a legitimate company. And now my thing is this, if they spent at half the time trying to really work as they do trying to get over, they, who knows where they would be? I tell students who try to cheat on exams and tests and get around that if you spend a third of the time investing in studying for what it is and where it is you're trying to go and accomplish, you could be an AB honor roll student. You could be valedictorian. You could be salutatorian. If so many of us spent the time saying to God, God, have your way. What is it you want me that you want me to get out of this dilemma? What is it that you want me to get out of this trouble? What is it that you're trying to speak to my heart while I'm going through instead of trying to avoid persecution, avoid the pressing, avoid the cutting, avoid the, the pressing places of life? And so if you spent the time to put in the effort to say, God, not my will, your will be done. Though you slay me, yet Will I trust you, O oh God? And we know, Romans 8, 28, that all things work, I could stop right there, for me, according to the, the good that I have in me, his purpose that he's trying to accomplish, what he's trying to do on my behalf, it's working for my good. But we we want to we want to get away from and out of the wheel because it's uncomfortable. We want to get out of the way of God because it doesn't feel good. Well, can I help you with something? God or I am not concerned about your feelings. The devil with your feelings, because feelings keep us out of, out of the will of God. Feelings can keep us out of the way of God. Feelings will keep you out of the plan of God. God wants your God wants you to tell your feelings. I said it before. I said again to go to hell. God could care less about how hot you think it is in this Texas heat when your air condition goes out of your car. He's not concerned about your comfort. He's concerned about your character. And that's what he'll do. And I've discovered you'll stay right there until you learn the lesson that God is trying to impose upon you. So, so instead, instead of running, instead of hiding, instead of tipping, instead of dipping, instead of dodging, we need to learn to face it head on. I, I'll never forget. I used to be over the benevolence ministry. One of my former churches in Florida. And there was a regular who used to come for help. Uh, she was not a member of the church, I don't believe, but she used to come regularly for help from the church. Uh, so much so until I actually started pre-filling out a check with her name on it just to wait on the amount that she would come ask for. And so this one particular uh, quarter, uh, she came. And when she came, she said, I need money to help me pay my rent. And so I I, 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 I apologize. In, uh, uh, in, what's the word? Um, I was empathetic, empathetically. I po apologized to her, and I said to her, "I said, I'm, uh, um, I'm so sorry. Uh, I just wrote the last check for the last uh, amount, piece of amount that that for this quarter, and so the the account of the funds were replenished every quarter, and so I just written a check and given out the last check to help somebody else. She went off on me." at the church 
What am I supposed to do now? You knew I was coming. I'll come every quarter. And this, that, and the other. And she went on, and I said, I called her by name. I said, well, sister, you know what? I, I think this time, you, you, you just may have to go through. Go through? And what do you mean, go through? I mean, she, she, <laughs> she went off about going through. And there's a principle there, ladies and gentlemen. God is not going to always come and snatch us out of whatever it is he has us in because there's a purpose and a plan for the reason that God has us at. He's working it out. Whatever it is, he's working it out. Sometimes he's working it out of you. Sometimes he's working out the situation. Sometimes he's working it out while you're in it, in somebody else's life. But whatever it is, he's working it out. And sometimes, I wish I had somebody. You need to understand, if you were to look in the book of Daniel, you'll see, you'll see two scenarios and two illustrations where both Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel, they find themselves in a fiery furnace. And Daniel finds himself in a den. And both sex or sections or of individuals were men of God, loved the Lord, would not bow down, would not change, would not compromise, loved God with everything they had, would not obey the king, would not do what the king said because they loved God more. That's a principle there during this time of Corona, why everybody's talking about obey the king, obey the law, obey the this. They would not obey the king, they obeyed God. And they found themselves in a, a pressing predicament. They found, Daniel found himself in the den. The Hebrew boys or men found themselves in the fiery furnace. But watch this. God did not deliver them out of the furnace, out of the den. He delivered them while they were in the furnace and while they were in the den. You missed that. Uh, uh, Daniel, hey, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were not were not sent, taken out of the fire. God didn't say, okay, well, let me get them out before they set this thing on fire. No. What? The, matter of fact, they heated the fire up seven times hotter than it normally is before they threw them in there. So much so that the one that threw them in there died. They did not say, God did not say based on Daniel's prayer life, which he had a strong prayer life. God didn't say, oh God, because of his prayer life and his dedication and his faithfulness, let me stop this thing before it gets out of hand. No. He let them go in there and he let them. Here's the testimony. Here's the miracle that while they're in there, they were not consumed and that they came out while they were in. I'm trying to help somebody. You missed that. He did not take them. He did not prevent no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Yeah, it didn't say that the weapon would not be formed. It just said it won't prosper. Oh God, all these crybaby Christians, all these crybaby believe, oh Lord, they talking about me. Oh, what you going to, no, no. It didn't say that the weapon would not be formed form, it just simply said, no, why, oh God, I'm going to say, the, can I quote the whole verse? The whole verse says, no weapon that is formed against me shall prosper. Now watch this part. And this ought to make you shout right here. Because while they form in the weapon, here's the thing. Not only shall it not prosper, but every tongue that riseth up against me in judgment shall be condemned. I'm trying to help somebody today. Somebody trying to get free today. Y'all done got me all off task. And so, so, so here it is, that while you're going through what you're going through, instead of trying to avoid what you're going through, ask God, what is it that you're trying to do in this situation, in me, in this, in them? How do you want me to respond? You really don't have to ask that question because if you're a man or woman of faith, a man or woman of the word, the word is constantly telling us how we respond in dire situations. Are you listening to me? And so, so 
God wants you to, to, to stay there. And he wants you to allow. He wants you to overcome. He wants you to use it for your good and your growth. He wants you to take advantage of your adversity and take advantage. He wants you to shift your obstacle into your opportunity. And he wants you to turn your burden into your blessing. Far more often than not, we find ourselves sandwiched between the backdrop of, of, of a pleasurable place of complacency over against the seeking, seeming risk of a future possibility. And so as we stand on the brink of greatness, and I'm talking to you, yet yeah, even in the midst of COVID, even in the midst of Corona, even in the midst of economic upheaval and reversal, as we stand on the brink of greatness, will we, we allow the obstacle on the roads of life to detour us, discourage us, or, or impede our progress, or will we press forward? I'm trying to help somebody. Press forward navigate to new heights, to charter new territories, impact the world for Jesus Christ. Because how you go through, my God, there are people who are waiting and watching while all of this is going on and all of the ground is sinking sand. They're watching, drawing strength on how you will go through. How will you go through? Or will you? My God, that was a, I said, how will you go through? Or will you? Or will you stop prematurely? Will you abort the baby while the contractions are going on? While you're in labor? Will you will you strangle the baby? Will you murder the baby? Will you still will you be a co-contributor in the stillbirth of your baby? Because because now is the time. I tell people you know what's in a person by how they go through. Because anybody can talk a mean game in, when the sun is shining. Talk a mean game while you're looking at the rainbow. But how do you go through the storm? How do you go through the storm? The obstacles of mediocrity, of, of settling business as usual, fear of the future and, and tomorrow, lethargic and, and complacent people, the toxic attitudes and setbacks and failures. I, and and I've, 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 I've discovered, ladies and gentlemen, that much like the peasant uh, was rewarded for putting in work, for putting in work, you and I as believers, Christians, children of God will be rewarded for persevering. Do you understand this? Let me help you with something. God honors faithfulness. I'm going to say that. I'm going to say it. God honors faithfulness and faithfulness honors God. Hebrews 11 and 6 says without faith, it is what? Impossible to please God. And so do you think that after catching all the hell you have caught, and still stayed steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, that God would not reward you for your faithfulness, for your loyalty, for your bulldog tenacity to stick to it, though he slayed you? You chose to stand you didn't look to the right or to the left. You staggered not at the promises of God. And you think God is not going to reward that, honor that? God is not your daddy who left you when he went to go get a loaf of bread and never came back. God is not your deadbeat daddy. God is not your uh, ratchet mama. God is not your stepmama, foster parent. God, that's not who God is. So while we have this, this, this fictitious and fictional mind of who we think God is. God is saying, that's not me. He rewards your faithfulness. He reward. we don't work because we have to. We work because we want to. Because we're not saved by, by faith, I'm, by works. We're saved by grace through faith. It's not our works that save us. It's not our works that keep us. It's not our work. And when I say work, I mean just don't go nowhere. You might not even have the strength to press on. But if you just got the strength to stand on, my God. Maybe you can't take another step. But maybe you could just stand. I tell people, even if you feel like taking off your shoes, if you could just stand, 
God will honor your ability to stand when you want to take your shoes off. Now I've discovered that it's much like the peasant. If, if we work like the peasant farmer who was rewarded by the king, if we stay steadfast, if we be not weary in doing well, then, then watch this. In due season, we'll reap if we do not faint. Huh? You and I as believers, as Christians, children of God, will be rewarded for persevering through the obstacles, the difficulties, the setbacks that try to hinder us, hurt us, and harm us when we use it to harness the power of God to help us, teach us, train us, grow us. And, and usually, ladies and gentlemen, God, what God will do is he will seek to work in a place where there are people of purpose and pursuit and during those moments where he forces us to face the roadblock. And, and here's what I, what do you mean, apostle? Sometimes you don't know God is all you need to God is all you got. God will force, he'll close every door just so that all roads lead to him. He won't let you, you've been used to going to Big Mama when you were in trouble and Paul Paul when you needed some help with the rent and, 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 your, and your homeboy, your homegirl who could bail you out. God will shut all of that down just so you can trust in him. You don't know that God is all you need until God is all you've got. And so during those moments, he forces us to face, my God, the roadblocks. I said during that time, he forces you to face the roadblocks. You 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 talking about God, give me more faith. He said, okay. Let me shut some doors. Let me shut God, I want stronger faith. All right, let me let me shut some doors. Because I don't remember a time when I could not go to my grandmother and she did not have a roll of hundred dollar bills that she could, on you know, a fixed income, that she could go in and get out and reel off a if you needed some help. But God has so fixed that thing to not even grandmama can help you out. Are you listening to me? And so, so he will force that all roads lead you to deal with the roadblock that you find yourself in. My God. Watch this. Between what roadblock, Pastor? What roadblock? What roadblock, Apostle? During those moments, he forces us to face the roadblock that stands between our past and our future. See, there's a roadblock that stands between our past and our future. Where, watch this, where there's a decisive moment. I call it a defining moment. A moment of decision. A, there's a decisive moment of, of leaving what's behind and seizing what's ahead. Do you do understand that's coming, right? There's a time that's coming that you're going to have to make a choice. My God, today, you're going to have to make a choice. And, 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 and here's what I found out about God. God will let you have your little fun. God will let you do your little thing and, and sow your little wild oats. And he'll let you uh, do whatever you do. But then there's coming a defining moment, a moment of decision where you got to make a choice. Will it be God or will it be man? Will it be God or job? God or money? God or promiscuity? God or drinking? God or crack? God? Will it be God or whatever else? You've got to make a choice. Prophet says, that's for me and my house. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Will it be God or man? The choice is yours. But as for me and my house, we will. He didn't. It wasn't a suggestion. It was. It wasn't an elective. It was a required course. He said, "As for me and my house, we will." It was an affirmative. Serve the Lord. And so, so there's a time coming, ladies and gentlemen, where you're going to have to choose how you handle the block, the roadblock, the rock, the the obstacle that separates you from your your your. You're not yet and you're right now. My God. 
seizing what's in. That becomes the determining factor for success or defeat. Where there are inevitably mixed and varying emotions about the future. Consequently, I remember uh, years ago, those of you who are new to the city who may not know our history concerning our professional, former professional football team, NFL team. I remember years ago while I was still in school, matter of fact, I went to the very last game that the, the Oilers played or were to play in the Houston Astrodome. Bud Adams had become disgruntled with the city uh, because he desired a new stadium. Uh, and, 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 and if you don't know Bud Adams, Bud Adams was the owner of the uh, Houston Oilers. And so the, the city would not approve the building of a new stadium. Uh, and, and so he said, I tell you what, I never forget this. I was at this game. We were, we were still supporting no matter what. And, and, and the Oilers would not come out on the field. Because they said that the, the, the playing conditions were not conducive to play the game. Now, they could have said that before the game. They waited till all 50 or 60,000 people showed up to the game. And then came out to say that they were not coming out of the, of the tunnel to come onto the field. As, uh, to which the, the fans began to boo and were disgruntled and upset. But, 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 but. Bud says we're going to pack up and move. So, so, so the they they left Houston. They went to Tennessee. Uh, Tennessee has a new team. They changed their name from the Oilers to those of you who know them today as the Tennessee Titans. Bud Adams packed up the Oilers, went to Tennessee, and 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 they now have been a, a they have been a great part of the history and the legacy. Uh, anybody know Love You Blue? We had our own song, Houston Oilers, Houston Oilers, Houston Oilers number one. I mean, and they, I mean, that was, that was it. Love you, blue. Earl Campbell, Billy White Shoes Johnson, Dan Pastorini, Kenny Stabler. Oh man, you name them. We had them. We were ready. We were pro Oilers fans. That was, that was our, that was our team. And so, so, so the, 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 the national Football League, our professional football franchise, was no more. And and then we lose we lose our football team franchise. We're 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 we're, we're the home of one of the, the 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 eighth wonder of the world, the Astrodome, the first dome stadium in the nation. The Astrodome is in Houston, Texas. But the Astrodome loses some of her glory. Stay with me. Her lure. She doesn't she doesn't have her team that was connected to her. The Oilers. Coupled with the Oilers leaving for Tennessee, the Houston Astros now have built their own stadium downtown. They used to play in Astrodome, and now they built Minute Maid Park downtown. So, so, so you see where I'm going with this, right? Now, now, now there are there there were people who were tied to tradition and the lore of the glory of the Astrodome because it really reminded them of the great era of life of the city of Houston. You cannot think of Houston without thinking of the Astrodome. Then a few days later, a man named McNair comes on the scene. Watch this. Cements a proposal to the NFL and to, to Houston for a new football team. He submits it to the National Football League, and they accepted it. And hence, a new football team is entered into the city of Houston. Well, that that's what comes. Guess what comes with a new football team? A new stadium. A new stadium. Huh? Are you listening to me? What comes with a new football? And and so so the football team built a new stadium called Reliant. And so, so at the end of the era of, of the Houston Oilers, and, and it's gone, and the Astrodome is no more. And I remember when we were, we were going through the bidding process of mascots, and, and they were talking about maybe we'd be the Houston Oilers again, or the, or the Houston Roughnecks, or, and then they settled on the Houston Texans. Then they started construction on Reliant. I'm still going somewhere. Stay with me. And of course, there were mixed emotions because Reliant was built on the parking lot of the Astrodome. And, and who would have ever thought that, that another arena could overshadow 
what was once the eighth wonder of the world in the nation of our country. And, and the Asher Dome was set off in the shadows of what now is Reliance Stadium. And so watch this. So now you got you got the people of, of the past who, who are nostalgic like me because I'm a Houston Oilers fan. I'm an Oiler. And everybody in my generation or older were Oilers fans. And so, so there are mixed emotions. We don't want them. We, don't want, we want, yeah, we want a team, but we want our all us back. We want our, we want our Astrodome to be restored. We want all this stuff, and and none of this was happening. And so the Astrodome still stands, but they started building Reliant, and the new state new stadium didn't look nothing like the old one. People remembered the Astrodome. They wanted the Astrodome. They wanted the multicolored seats, orange, yellow, and amber inside the, the rainbow colors in the Astrodome. And on a perfect day, it could rain in the Astrodome. <laughs> oh, yeah, it'll rain. The roof had leaks. In. It would rain atmosphere, if the atmosphere wasn't right. It was, it, was, it was a phenomenon. It was a special place. But now, Reliant is on its way, and people have mixed emotions. Now watch this, because 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 we don't know anything about these Houston Texans or this Bob McNair, but we know the Houston Oilers. Now, and I tell people I've counseled a number of people. I've had women specifically who who have been in abusive relationships who will say something like, you know, uh, 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 I say, why don't you just leave? Because you you've been physically abused, verbally abused, emotionally abused, mentally abused. And I said, why don't you just leave? They say, well, I, it's better to stay with the devil I know. Then they get to know a whole new devil. I say that's retarded. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard before in my life. Well, well, watch this. The same, even though we have been abused by Bob, by Bud Adams, who left us out there in the rain by ourselves, waiting for the orders to come out, we still would rather have him than these new kids coming on the block. Are oh, you listening to me? And so, so that, the, and 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 there were those who who were hurt. Stay with me. There were those who are here in the city of Houston who, who were hurt and, and then what, because they had left and because, because we felt like the city had, had abandoned our, our dear beloved Astrodome and our Oilers. But, but here's the thing, and I'm going to bless you real quick and I'm going to move on. They were, they were, there were those who were hurt by that. And then there were, there were, there were their children who had never in their life heard of a Houston Oilers. I'm trying to help somebody. I said there were those who were living in the past who had mixed emotions about what was going on, but then there were the children, their children, who didn't know anything about an Orla, about an Astrodome. They were excited just to have a brand new professional team. See, they were born in a city that didn't have a football team. I'm trying to help somebody. They were born in a city that did not have a stadium that was state of the art. And so to have any team, any stadium, they were excited about. And so, and so th there are and were mixed emotions in the city of Houston. But we see here through the text and the spirit breathing between the very lines of the text and, and the context that, that there were mixed emotions about what was going on in Jerusalem as well. Our setting here marks the end of a season. Ladies and gentlemen, let me stick a pen here and say simply this to you. If, if God has transitioned you from, a, from, from the season of, 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 oh man, of what used to be, of what once was, and God is trying to take you somewhere greater, higher, deeper, into a realm or sphere that you've never experienced, but you want to fight him tooth and nail, kicking and screaming while he's trying to drag you into your future and your blessing and greatness and perpetual, uh, did you hear me? I said perpetual blessing, perpetual prosperity. Then, then, then if you're going to fight, God is only going to drag so long, if at all. Are you listening to me? Our, our setting here marks the end of a season and the, and the ushering forth of a new one. 
Do you know what commencement is? Commencement exercise at a graduation. The commencement exercise. The word commencement means the end of one thing and the beginning of something else. The end of the matriculation of high school or school by way of secondary uh, uh, level education. And then some may go on to post-secondary level or college. Others may go to trade school. Some may go to Army, Military, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, Coast Guard. Some may do something else. But, but the word commencement means the end of one thing, the beginning of the other. Let me help you understand something. You can't go to college acting like you're still in high school. Huh? What do you mean by that, Apostle? See, mama ain't going to be there with you to wake you up saying it's time to get up to go to class. And nobody's going to be there. That They're going to give you a syllabus with your required reading. They're going to give you a syllabus, let you know when the exams and the tests are. And nobody's going to remind you of that. Nobody's going to tell you you got to study. Nobody's going. So if you had that mindset in high school, when you go to college, you're going to mess around and fail because nobody's there. you got to watch this. You, you, it's a commencement. You're trying to, you're trying to usher what should have stopped. Into your next realm. My God. You're trying to usher what ceased and should be not into what is, was meant for something else. What do you mean? Let me give you a visual. You're trying to put a square peg into a round hole. It just don't fit. And so, so commencement. The end of one thing, the beginning of something new. And so, so, so here we saw God, what do you say? God had raised Jesus from the dead. He's raised Jesus from the dead. It is the picture or the depiction in Ezra 3, Ezra 3, 10 through 13, where Cyrus or Cyrus, king of Persia, issues a decree to all the people to return to their home after 70 years in exile. And, and, and he issues a decree to construct and to finance a new building of the temple and the same month and location of Solomon's first temple. Uh, the new temple will be magnificent, grand, glorious. The new generation was excited. For they knew nothing about Solomon's temple. As for the, 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 the temple began to erect and the people began to let out great shouts and joy and accolation and, and adulation and adulation. Uh, there, there is an opening of, of a new chapter. The old has died. In comes on the onset, the new, the changing of the guard. Progress for the future is to be celebrated. A new foundation was a big deal. The people gave a great shout, priestly garments, praise and thanksgiving. New, anybody talking about new? It's a new day, new time, new purpose, new new destiny, new, new wisdom, new mindset, new, just new, I'm trying to help somebody. New, a new new potential, new experiences in, in all and, and with God, new, watch this, new vehicles, new homes, new jobs, new testimonies reminds us that God is still faithful. But then there were those who saw the former temple and wept. Now, let me stick a pen here and say, I'm not saying that everything old and everybody old should be put in the corner somewhere and left by themselves to drive. No, 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 no. You miss, you miss me if you if that's what you're hearing. There's a, there's a place to honor that that led the way to bring us to where we are. I said to the people of God, I believe uh, during our Sunday services, uh, I, one of the things it says when God tells Joshua, Moses, my servant is dead. Now get up and walk and cross over this Jordan. You and this people. Now. He's not saying act like Moses never lived. He's not saying act like Moses didn't teach you anything. He's not saying act like Moses didn't contribute anything. Moses was with these people for 40 years. But he says, he says, grieve. I'm not telling you not to grieve. I know you was with you for a while. Grieve. Spend time. Take your time. But don't spend your life grieving and miss the promised land. Don't stay in your place of grief 
Because because they, they were good. It was good. She was good. He was good. The job was good. But but it's over now. I'm trying to help somebody. Woo! It's a rough, it's a rough word. But somebody needs to say it. I might as well be me. It's over now. And since it's over now, now it's time to move on to, to where God, the next station, the next juncture, the next avenue in your life, for your life, that God has for you. You're going to mess around and stay stagnant, stale, and sterile and not get what God wants for you because you're thinking and living in your past, living, looking in the rearview mirror, driving, watching what's behind you instead of looking into your future and your destiny. God wants so much for you. But you have these mixed emotions. Woo! You have these mixed emotions. Should I, should, you know, I had a, that was a, that was a, that was a lady or a gentleman. I think it was a lady in our church in Florida. Who, uh, who visited our church for, for a while. And so I asked her, when I said, when are you going to join, when are you going to get married and stop shacking? <laughs> When are you going to get married and stop? When are you going to join? She said, oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. My mama would kill me if I left our family church. Now, let me, let me, let me be clear. Let me set the stage for you. She's, she's 50. She's 50 years old. And, 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 and she, she's sucking up all our biscuits and gravy and taking space from our, our members and, 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 and sitting on our cushion pews. And shouting up our carpet and putting holes in it. And, and then, and, and but she don't want to commit. She didn't want to commit. Are oh, you listening to me? She, she doesn't, you, so you're going to miss what God has for you. Because, because your mama, your mama, your, your daddy, your, your husband, your job, your children, I, I, I will let nothing separate me, says the word of God, from the love of God. Nothing or nobody can separate me from the will of God, from the love of somebody. Shout, period. You ought to just type in period, period. Nobody, nobody. So you're being blessed. You're growing. You're developing. You're becoming what God wants you to be. And 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 you scared of a, a, a tradition, a religion? Now don't get it twisted. I'm a firm believer that that traditions are good, as long as they don't separate you from the will of God. That's when traditions become suspect and fire breathing dragons. When 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 you put a tradition before God's word and His plan for your life. And so I'm going, no, I will let nothing separate me from the will, the love, the purpose, the plan, the destiny, the aim, whatever he desires for me. Guess what? That's where I'm going. I want to be in his will. The safest place in the whole wide world is still in the will of God. And so there are those that saw the former, former temple and they wept. They had mixed emotions. So the price for sin has been settled through Christ's vicarious death on the cross. He has defeated death. The old way has been done away with. It's no longer by the law of works, but rather through the new law of grace. And so this symbolic, uh, this is symbolic rather, of the fact that, that he hung on the cross. The veil, uh, you know, the, the veil was ripped from top to bottom, signifying that nobody had done this but God. So they, they are excited of, about what he did. But, but now they've got to face the reality that, that their teacher, stay with me, their master, their leader is now bequeathing his authority to them to do the work of the ministry upon the earth. Why? Because he's getting ready to go. And they have mixed emotions. Wait a minute, Jesus. I didn't sign up for this all by myself. I didn't, no, no, no. They're mixed emotion because they, they have been with him for three years. 
weeping in the midst of their joy, tears of sorrow in the midst of their gladness. And, and some of them have a problem adapting and adjusting to the mission that, that, that they've been given by Jesus. They, they, they kind of know, they, they, I'm gonna say, they, they kind of know what they're supposed to do. Because he, he walked with him for three years. Now, now it'll be it'll be some if he never. This is Jesus' whole message to the disciples while he's with them. I got to leave you. I'm getting ready to leave you. I'm teaching you this because I'm getting ready to go. I got to go to back to my father. I'm getting ready to leave you. You know it's the equivalent. I tell my I tell my girls this all the time. I'm not gonna always be here. I'm not gonna always be here. That's why you got to learn to do some stuff yourself. Dad is not going to always be here. I, I said it before and I'll say it again. Any parent that does not prepare his or her children for their demise does their children a grave disservice. And I'm not just telling them I'm not going to be here. I mean preparing the way. Life insurance. I, they shouldn't be taking offerings at your funeral. Oh, God. He done stopped teaching to start being paid. I said they shouldn't be taking offerings at your funeral. But any, any parent that does not teach his or her children and share with them <clears throat> or ready them for their departure does a grave injustice to them. And so it's the equivalent of the daddy or the mama constantly saying, dad is going, dad is leaving here, dad ain't going to be here. That's why I'm trying to teach you. Come here, sit down, let me show you something. Come here, come here, grab, take a seat. Let me talk to you. Come here, let me, come here, let me show you. This is what an insurance is. This is what a paperwork is. This is what a P.O. box is. This is what a safety deposit box is. This is this, this is that. And then, watch this. And then all of a sudden, they look up and you're not there. And now they don't know what to do. They don't have a clue. What to do? Why? Because they would not listen when they had the opportunity to listen. And such was the case here with the, with the apostles and the disciples that Jesus had mentored. The whole three years he's with them. He's saying, I got to leave you. I got to go. I'm leaving. I got to go back to see my father. My time is almost here. I'm not yet. Don't touch me. I've been glorified. I'm coming. I'm coming. And, and, and so they, they are confused. They've got mixed emotions. What are we to do now? There's, there's, there's sorrow because the future is upon them. And as, 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 as we move forward in this passage, uh, uh, we'll, we'll, see, we'll see a process. We'll see, we'll see how this helps us to change. Evaluate the purpose. Engage in the mission of the kingdom of God. And, and then compels us to press forward or toward the vision. Let, let me let me give you these real quick and I'm done. I didn't think I was going to be able to do it. I was trying to, you see, I'm trying to get them in. So, uh, what do I do when my emotions are mixed about the future? What am I to do when I, when I have mixed emotions about the future? The first thing is this, follow Christ's commission. Follow Christ's Crisis commission, all right? Uh, the great commission of, of, the, of the book of Matthew says, uh, go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even until the end of the earth. Apostle, what does that have to do with my, mixing, my emotions being mixed up? Well, if I'm if I have a varied emotion, uh, a varied playing field, a varied my my emotions are varied as a believer, as a Christian. If I stick to the commission, my God, the commission will always keep the playing field level. If I stick to the commission and the purpose and the destiny of God that He's destined for the kingdom for the body, then I'll stay true to myself as a Christian, as a believer. Our church must always be a place of, of uh, welcome, of open arms, open hearts. Uh, typically when people come to church or come to uh, a new family of believers, a lot of times they're in a different chapter in their life. 
They're, they're segueing from, from one chapter to another. No matter what, I'm not going to go into what it was that may have caused them to, to seek out a place of a different place of worship or they at their initial place of worship but whatever it was they find themselves in a new juncture in their life a new station in their life a new intersection a boulevard in their life and the only thing that that you with that being said let me help you change is the only thing that's constant Change is the only thing that's constant. If you think that 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 where you are is where you're gonna stay, you you're also sadly mistaken. Change. You don't even weigh the same weight you weighed ten years ago. You say I'm not being. See, I said I went way back. I said ten years ago. I didn't say two. I didn't say three months. I didn't say two weeks. <laughs> I said ten years ago. You don't wear the same dress size, pants size. Waist size, bra size, you, yeah, oh yeah, you got me. I'm going to deal with all of it. You don't wear the same, no, no, you don't. And yet you want everything to stay the same? No. Psalm 6, prophet of another generation says, everything must change. Everything will change. And so it is, it is, you might as well prepare your heart and your mind to ready itself for change. Change is coming. Change is here. Ready or not, here it comes. You can't hide. I'm trying to help some. It's going to find you. <laughs> Are you listening to me? It's going to find you. Change is the only thing that's constant. The only thing that will not change is change. God has brought his church into a new era a new day, a new experience in him. But before they can move forward, God's, God, in, 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 as it relates to God's moving and his ushering, uh, before he could get the people to move, they got to come to grips with the fact that they can't stay the same. You you can't take, God takes this, this ushering of this old mindset into new the newness of what he's trying to do so serious. You don't, you've heard it. I don't have to tell you. I'm not going to beat it to death. He takes it so serious that he let an entire, an entire generation die off in the wilderness because, because they did not want to take a new mindset into the promised land. And rather than let them take that same stinking thinking into their new community development, to their new home, to their new land, he let them die. Everybody that was over 20 died because he did not want that faithless thinking contaminating what he was trying to do. So, so don't be arrested by your varied emotions of what it is that God is doing in this season. Well, you know, we always done it like that. Well, those are the we are, are here's the seven last the seven last words of a dying church. We've never done it like that before. And and watch this. If you always do what you've always done, then you'll always have what you've always had. You've got to allow God to do something different. And God is not going to force your hand. God is not going to force your hand. God is going to sit back. He is a perfect gentleman. He is going to sit back and he's going to allow you to invite. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if you will open the door, then he says, I'll come in. I'll sup with you. And then you can say, he said, I'll come in. I'll sit down. I'll sup with you. And then you can sup with me. He's not coming in doing no, God ain't coming in doing no spiritual kick door. God's not doing a spiritual home invasion. He's not coming in talking about where's your heart? Give it to me now. Where's your allegiance? Give it to me right now. Put it on spiritual AK. God ain't coming in jacking you, talking about I'm taking over this house. I got this now. No, God says he wants to be invited to be the president of the house. He didn't want to just be the resident of the house. What does that mean? God didn't just want to live there. He wants to run it, but he needs to be invited in. He needs to be invited in. God is ready to move us forward. But in order to advance, 
We've got to let go of yesterday. If you're going anywhere, you've got to let yesterday go. The grudges of yesterday. The hangups of yesterday. The hurts of yesterday. The, the inadequacies of yesterday. The mistakes of yesterday. Let it go. He wants to move you to the next realm, the next dimension, the next sphere of your life and purpose. But in order to advance, you've got to let it go. Move forward in what God has prepared for us. The book of Acts was written by Luke, the physician. I'm, I'm, I got to get out of here. Paul's beloved companion. He's the author of the book of Luke. Unfortunately, it bears the wrong title, I believe, because because most of the 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 editions of the scripture were, is called the Acts of the Apostles. But but as you read the book through, the 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 only apostles that actually their acts are recorded there are Peter and Paul. So so it really, I think, the more accurate depiction of the book of Acts should be the 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 Acts of the Holy Spirit. Of the acts of, of the of the, the spirit. And so the, the, the book should read that. The book, the acts of the Holy Spirit. The, the, the ones with whom God often used the most are the ones that we expect the least. Why why is it why is it so often that we ascribe value and worth and significance to watch this based on surface and superficial stuff? I say that again. We ascribe worth and value and significance if they're the right height, if they're the right build. Oh, she fine. She must be. She must be worth it all. What's what's that label you wearing? What's that Chanel? Ferragamo? What's that? What's that? Louis? Oh, look. Oh, she worth. He worth something. Those glasses by themselves. That's a grand. Huh? She worth some. We, we, we attribute worth based on surface and superficial stuff. That's why I'm glad that God doesn't look at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. And so that's how we do. I'm glad he doesn't. Because, because this fades. This fades. This, see, I used to, I used to have air. And all my hair ran down to my face. <laughs> I said, I used to have hair. I said, all my hair ran down to my chin. <laughs> but, 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 so, so, he, he, we are not to act as the world. Because, because the world defines worth and attributes worth and ascribes worth and value based on that system. But Jesus says, it shall not be so amongst you. That's how the Gentiles act. That's how the world acts. That we that we may, we, we, that may be how the world defines you for this. But God looks from a different perspective, through a different spectacle. God is not looking for status. God is looking for surrender. Are you listening to me? God is not looking for status. He's looking for your surrender. That's why when you're trying to figure out how she get that, how he get that, how she get him, how he get her, he's looking for surrender. That's how he got her. Surrender. That's how he got her. Surrender. I'm trying to help somebody. You're going to get to play on word in a minute. God doesn't base it on this stuff here. See, while you think you've got it figured out, they're in their room with the door closed on their face before God crying out to God. But we're called to reach and to reproduce a people who surrender wholeheartedly to the kingdom agenda. And, and, and watch this, and point up in worship and point out in outreach and point in through empowering themselves to edify and to impact the city, the region, a state, a nation, a world for Jesus Christ. And so the book of Acts is really a sequel to the book of Luke. In the Gospel of Luke, the Son of Man offered his life. In the Acts, the Son of God offers his power. My God. That thing says, have you received power since you believe? The Holy Ghost since you believe? 
In the, in the Gospels, we see the original seeds of Christianity. In the Acts, we see continual growth of the church. In the Gospel of Luke, it tells Christ, Christ was cru crucified and risen. Acts speaks of the Christ who ascended and, and exalted. The Gospel of Luke models the Christian life lived by the perfect man. Acts models it as it's lived out by the imperfect humanity. The former shows me God is not through with me yet. That's what I'm trying to get you to understand. I'm still in the process. That's why we have to trust the process. Because we're still in process. Are you listening to me? We want to skip the process. And circumvent what God is trying to get out of us. Let me, I'm done. I'm done. I've overstayed my time. But let me let me say this. Speaking of processes, the University of Ohio did a did, did a study some years ago about a, a about a butterfly. And and they had two uh caterpillars. Well, cocoon. They were cocoon. And so you had those, the the two. There was one that they allowed the butterfly to go through the natural process of of Ex, ex being extract or extracting himself out of the cocoon himself and then the other was helped by way of science scientists took a scalpel and cut the cocoon to allow the butterfly to come out with their help the natural process of the butterfly allowed it to go through the whole process to squirm and to struggle and to push and press against what was pressing against him to come out of the cocoon. Well, when the, both had come out, we came to the realization that the one you, that was helped out was crippled and would soon die after a day or two. Because a part of a butterfly being a butterfly is the process of the struggle. I'm trying to help somebody. Because as he struggles out of the cocoon, it pushes the fluid out of his body to hydrate his wings. That gives us the beauty that is the butterfly. So that we can see and observe and behold that that is the butterfly. But that can only take place via the struggle. And yet, when we want it easy, you may never survive. Why? Because you can't take anything. You can't go through anything. The most vital point of going through is the through. My God. You got to go through to get through. You don't get through without going through. I'm done. I say you don't get through without going through. I know we have mixed emotions about our future. I know we have mixed emotions about what God is doing. Many of us have questions about tomorrow. And don't know what we can face. But here's what I can guarantee you. You may not know what tomorrow holds. But you know who holds tomorrow. And if you trust. Him. Who is able to. Steal the storms. And calm the sea. It doesn't matter what tomorrow holds. You know. Who holds tomorrow. Amen. I challenge you. Don't. I'm, our emotions are part of who God made us. Don't get it twisted. He, he gave us these emotions. But we don't allow our emotions to govern our actions. Motions, I, I've said it before, our emotions are indicators. They're not designators. I'm trying to help you. They're indicators. They indicate something's going on. They indicate. So if emotions start doing what emotions do, that doesn't mean you camp out on emotion. That means you get on your face and start praying. If emotions start, you start feeling funny and, and, and start feeling shifts in your, your atmosphere, your, your spiritual uh, barometric pressure is, is starting to shift, then that means you don't say, oh, Lord, let me just, oh, I'm going to just sit here and be depressed and stop down in my, no. That means you get somewhere and start fasting. That means you get somewhere and get in the word. That means you get somewhere in prayer. That means you get with a prayer partner or an accountability partner. But emotions are not destinators or designators. They are, they are, they are indicators. They're indicators. They tell us something's going on. You, we've just got to listen to the indication that something is going on and then go after God with everything we've got. Amen. 
Amen. Well, that's my time. I, I, I've overstayed my boundary. I wanted to have you done at least by 8 o'clock, no later than, than uh, 8.15. But uh, let's go ahead and pray together. Father, we thank you tonight for your word. Thank you for challenging us in the area of our emotions and about the future. Sometimes the future can be so overwhelming that we don't know if we're coming or going. But God, we ask right now that even as your word declares, Jesus the same today, yesterday, forevermore. And because he's constant and we possess him, he's in our hearts. Then that same continuity and consistency that Jesus has, God, as we have him in us, we pray that you will regulate our minds, regulate our hearts, regulate our thoughts, regulate our actions and our deeds, because we don't want to be all over the place. We want to be constant. We want to be still and know that you are God watching you do what only you can do. We love you tonight. And it's our desire to please you and be what you would have us to be. I pray for your people. Keep them, strengthen them, sustain them, and let them know that even when they find themselves being anxious and being emotional, your word says in the book of Philippians, we're to be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, make our requests known unto the Lord. And so God, we do that tonight. Whatever we're dealing with, wherever we are, whatever we're facing, whatever we are not facing, whatever we don't have, whatever we do desire, God, we lay it all at your feet. We cast our cares on you because we know you care for us. And so we take up this yoke. This yoke is not, your yoke is not heavy. You said your yoke is light and your, bird, your burdens are light and your yoke is easy. And so we bless you tonight because you're that kind of God. It's a fixed fight. We don't even have to swing. We're just going through the motions. The fight is already won. You did it for us on Calvary. And so we bless you. We thank you. We honor you. Forgive us for our sins. They're forever before you. We thank you for provision. We thank you for making ways. We thank you for opening doors. Even in this during this time of pandemic, even during this time of chaos and 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 and, and mayhem, God, we you are still blessing. You're still keeping. You're still healing. And we thank you, Lord. Still providing. Still making ways. Still opening doors. That's who you are. And we thank you. We ask your blessings upon your people. Keep them, strengthen them, undergird them. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank God. Amen. Amen. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for this time together. Amen. I, I, again, I didn't mean to carry on so long. Uh, but, but, but sometimes I tell people, good meat makes its own gravy. And uh, I'm just still excited about the word. I'm excited about the word. I still get excited about the word. Even now, sad, 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 sad man of God, sad woman of God. If you don't get excited about the word you're teaching, something's wrong with that picture. You might need to revisit. Revisit. Amen. Well, that's been our time. Thank you so much. I pray that you have a great rest of your week and uh, continue to pray for those that are, are, are bereaved, those that have lost loved ones, those that are sick and, and uh, dealing with uh, not just the coronavirus, but other underlying ailments and issues. We pray God's covering and protection upon them, that he continue to, to hold them to his bosom. Keep them safe from all harm and danger. Hey, again, that's our time. Until this time next week, you remember we walk by faith and not by 